Hi, good evening. I'm Paul Wheels from IoT North. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we've got some fantastic talks this evening from uh, Wireless Logic and Rover Robotics. Um, first of all, we've got a bit of a, an announcement that we've been shortlisted for the Dynamites 2020 uh, with uh, Dynamo uh, here in the Northeast. Um, so uh, fingers crossed uh, we um, uh, are successful um, in, in this competition for the growth explosion as we've grown from um, 600 members earlier this year to well over 3,000. So thank you to everybody uh, for that and uh, helping this community grow. Um, tonight, as I mentioned, we've got wireless logic and Rover Robotics. Um, interesting, quite close ties in regards to um, some vision statements and using vision as a sensor from both talks. Um, and really, um, I've, I've, I've seen the presentations for both and I think you'll enjoy them thoroughly. Um, first of all, we have Rover Robotics and uh, Nick. Hi, Nick, I'm just going to unmute you. So I've muted you. I've just unmute. There we go. How are, you, how are you doing? Good, very good. All right. So just for a wider audience, Nick, um, do, would you like to introduce yourself and um, your location as well? Yeah, so I'm I'm Nick Fergali. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rover Robotics. We're a startup based out of uh, Minnesota, so right in the middle of the US. Um, calling in it's about noon here um i've been working with paul wheels for a, probably a, a year now since pack expo around it that year, it was a year last week we met for the first time at pack expo in vegas yeah so we did uh kind of a, a, a joint booth there or at least we had a demo in, in the 80 link booth where we were showing off some uh stuff to the packaging community what you can do with ground robots um and yeah, ever since we've been doing some co-marketing events with 80 Link, they're they're a strong partner of ours. We we build uh, affordable robots, affordable and rugged. They build uh, rugged and affordable compute that is very popular on robots. So uh, very that that's the connection there. Uh, so yeah, I'm very very excited that I could get an opportunity uh, to come present. Uh, sounds hey. like you you guys usually do. Uh, in-person meetings before COVID. So this is kind of a good opportunity. One good thing that came of it is, is I get to present from all the way from the U.S. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's certainly helped us as a community uh, come closer together and, uh, and dramatically uh, grow. Um, and it's also given us the opportunity to be able to bring in partners like yourself um, to, to come and talk. And uh, hopefully um, this side of things, the positivity of COVID continues. Hey, Nick, how did you get into robotics? Uh, so I got into robotics in college. I got my degree uh, in ro robotics specifically. So I've been doing it for about uh, five years now. And I, I really uh, started in the space because I was passionate about software, but I, uh, it was a bit daunting um, to get into a software position where I was at my desk uh, for 40 hours a week. So I thought to myself, you know, what, what could I program that would get me away from my desk? <laughs> so landed on robotics and that's, that's where I've been ever since. And, and it's been pretty good at getting me, you know, away from the desk, doing testing. We do a lot of, you know, a lot of testing outdoors, a lot indoors, uh, a lot of hands-on work. So it's, it's been fun. It's a, it's a fun space to be a part of. Yeah. I mean, it certainly looked fun um, when we, when we were in Vegas together. Um, yes. You a lot, you've spent a lot more time away from the booth than what I did um, walking around with your robot, whereas yeah. I was in boxes with people with our um, pallet, pallet game that we've got using Vision. Um, so how did, how did Rover Robotics start? Uh, yeah, so we, we were founded in 2018, uh, but we were kind of an offshoot of a Silicon Valley startup that's much older. They, uh, they were founded in 2008 um, by some of the big names in, in Silicon Valley. And so they, they raised a bunch of money to create a, uh, a, a low cost uh, robotic platform that's also modular, but they were, they were a little bit ahead of their time. I mean, the, all this deep learning stuff really started uh, to pick up again in 2012 and they, they started in 2008. Uh, so it, it was a little bit of a missed opportunity timing wise for them. Um, so we, we're kind of an offshoot of them to bring all this deep learning, AI, all 
you know, computer vision stuff uh, to the same platforms that they originally designed back in 2008 to be uh, super low cost, um, very scalable, but still, uh, but still rugged. And so what's the plans for the future? Yeah, so we're, we're trying to bring together what, what currently is a bifurcated market uh, in robotics. So there's, there's commercial robots that go for a lot of money, kind of the going rate is, is between $30,000 and $80,000. And that's, that's what you're going to pay for something like a warehouse robot. Um, and then there's, then there's educational robots, and those tend to be sub $1,000. And, and they're very different. Um, the, there's not a lot of design thought put into the, the sub $1,000 ones. It's, it's not something you could really ever use for a business, and it's not intended for that. Um, and then, then the, the industrial and commercial robots, those ones, they're, they're very out of the reach of anyone who, uh, you know, wants to purchase a robot, you know, who has an idea with something uh, and wants to just do a quick proof of concept. It's kind of like you already have to have been involved in the space to really know, you know, what to buy because $30,000 is, is a large commitment. Um, and so we're trying to bring together those spaces where we, where you can have a, we call it a prosumer robot where you can purchase it on a credit card. It's, it's somewhere between, you know, like $500 and maybe $3,000. Uh, something you can purchase on a credit card if you have some idea for something you, some business idea. Um, and you can spin up a business and do a proof of concept, maybe show off to investors, uh, raise some money, and then, and then, uh, you know, and start providing a service uh, with that robot. And so we've seen a lot of success uh, from that type of market in, in the drone space. Those have fallen uh, incredibly in cost because largely due to like companies like DJI. Um, so we're looking to do something very similar in the robotics space where, uh, where we bring that, bring those costs way down and make it a lot more accessible. And as, as, as people say, kind of democratize, uh, ground robots. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed, uh, collaborating with you guys and, you know, taking the stuff that I work on with, with vision dev kits and such like with AD link. And, and sticking it onto wheels and start to automate things really brings things to life on the art of possible and what we do with it. I think that leads on quite nicely to your talk. Um, so I'll uh, let you take over and um, stop sharing screen. Sure. I'm going to turn off my video so that my presentation shares better. Okay. There we go. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. All right, perfect. So yeah, like I said, our, our company's name is Rover Robotics. Uh, we're a startup. Um, this is uh, a nice concept drawing that we have uh, from one of our customers who's doing uh, delivery with our robots. Um, we, in general, we, we, we sell the robots as a platform. So we, we, we see people do all sorts of things with them. Uh, delivery is, is probably, one of the main things that people do. Uh, and then the, the, the second main thing would be kind of inspection, um, more of like data collection, uh, mo more in line with like uh, I IoT type tasks, um, things you want more coverage. And, you, and if you want, don't want to pay the high costs of, of fixed infrastructure, infrastructure, you can put the various sensors on, on the robot and, and get more full coverage of your facility um, with that. And then they're all, they're all battery powered, so you can power your sensors uh, off the internal battery of the robot, and then uh, you can program the robot to do uh, a, either, a, you can program it to be autonomous, um, or we have a lot of customers kind of doing a, a mixed approach where you have uh, some tally up and some autonomy, and, uh, and that ends up being your end solution. So a little bit of a timeline for us. So we, we uh, launched our company back in January of 2018. Um, 
and then our first product was our Rover Pro series. Uh, so this this is uh, a pretty for the price point. Uh, it's it's more rugged and more feature rich than other competitors that are selling robots at thirty thousand dollars. And and we very consciously priced our uh, our robot very low to to try to see what uh, what applications people uh, would would think of of doing with our platform. So of our first 50 customers, we found that um, 49 out of the 50 were, were doing unique use cases. Um, and there, was, there was trends like for inspection and delivery, but there was only one, two customers who were doing the exact same thing in the exact same location. Like there would be um, inspection of like nuclear power plants or, or inspection of particle accelerators or inspection of steel facilities or, ins or inspection of inventory in warehouses or inventory in, in stores like Target or Walmart. Uh, but, but no two people uh, outside of two of the customers were doing the same thing in the same location. Um, so that, that told us that, that there's, there's a, a large need for modular systems where you can swap in and out components um, to really suit your needs. And we've seen a, a few of our competitors uh, over the past like 10 years, they come out with really nice, well-designed robots, but they build, they build the sensors and the computers uh, into the robot. And then those become, they, they either become obsolete uh, very quickly or or they just don't expand well to uh, to different applications, and so they they're really only used for one thing. And so if that uh, if that thing doesn't hap doesn't happen to take off, um, then then they're pretty limited with what they can do uh, as a company. So we keep all of our designs uh, very modular, um, and so that's uh, that's another strong connection to AD Link is uh, is AD Link's. Uh, style of selling their computers is, is very modular to serve the, the compute market uh, with their compute cards, um, easily upgradable in the future. Uh, we do the exact same type of approach to the robotics world where we keep our system very modular so you can swap, swap things out. Uh, so then um, fast forward uh, a couple of years and we, we launched a new robot in March of this year called the Rover Zero. Um, and that's uh, a much lower price point, so sub two thousand dollars. So really getting into that uh, realm where you can purchase it on a credit card. Um, so so basically, the the Rover Pro and the Rover Zero are, are the exact same uh, chassis and mechanical components. They they share about eighty to ninety percent of the same parts, uh, but they're but we took out all the expensive bits uh, and and made it much more affordable. Kind of similar to like, if you think of like the Tesla Roadster versus like the the, the Model S. Uh, we, we took out all this, the stuff that's gonna make it really expensive and kept just the stuff that we, we saw was really integral for, for customers. So um, we still have customers who brought, buy the Rover Pros for, for industrial applications. Um, those who need like an IP67 rating, uh, which is quite intense, like to give you an idea. So, so IP67 is a, a submersible up to three meters in water. Um, so you can actually drive our robots underwater and we've, we've tested them like that before. <laughs> so it's pretty cool, a pretty cool trick, but it's not something that everyone needs. Um, so uh, we've taken, taken that IP67 rating and, and dialed it back to, to more of like IP54, um, which we find uh, most customers are okay with um, that'll that'll deal with even like you can rain from above and, and stuff like that as long as you don't drive it through through a puddle that's gonna come up over the wheels uh, you're probably pretty good with that and that's that allows us to to knock three thousand dollars off the price because we don't have to uh, completely seal and test the robots and um, and it also removes a lot of the thermal Thermal management problems that uh, that we that we deal with with the Rover Pro, where you have pretty expensive heat pipes and heat sinks and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's what we are what our history has been so far. Um, so, like I mentioned, we're we're a startup based out of Minnesota. We're about ten people. Um, Minnesota's uh, right in the middle of the U.S. Um, so geographically, we uh, we're we're pretty. 
uh, pretty much in the middle of, of the two uh, robotics hubs that exist within the US. One is San Francisco and the other is Boston. Um, so we're, we're pretty much right in the middle of those two. So this is our, uh, this is our website. Uh, so we have up at the top, we have the, the two types of robots. We have the Rover Zero and the Rover Pro. Uh, pricing visi uh, visibility is a very big thing for us. So a lot of our competitors, they, uh, they're very B2B centric. Um, so they, you have to get a quote and it takes a long time to get your robot and, and it's, it's configurable, but that configuration is, is mostly done by the company. So it, it makes it so you have a long lead time. And uh, we wanted, our, our big goal is to change that. So you have short lead times, you have pricing visibility. Um, internally, we say kind of the goal for us is uh, building a robot should be as easy as building a computer. So like, for instance, I built a, a, a PC, uh, like a month ago and it, it took me a day to go to micro center and pick out all the parts and I got to choose from all these modular uh, components like you know power supply a, a chassis um, a motherboard a CPU and it's all there all all in stock all the prices are listed and you can assemble it uh, fairly easily uh, within a day and we think that's going to be the future of robotics since you you need that modularity to do all these different sort of applications. Um, but it's going to take a lot of vendors who who work together to to create uh, form factors that that are compatible with one another. So, so we're currently working with companies like Boston Dynamics and Ghost Robotics and and these other uh, providers of of ground robot systems to make our our form factors compatible with uh, with other payloads. Um, that's the other thing that we we list on our website uh, is is different payloads to get you started where you can easily mount different sensors, but we think the future of of kind of the payload market is is one where you you can have some payloads that are designed by the actual company, but but a large amount of those payloads are going to be third party, um, and so you can get a, a lot of different uh, payloads and you can you can choose which mobility type. Maybe a dog robot works better for your application. Maybe a wheeled one. Uh, maybe you don't know and you you try both uh, and and if the payload can be swapped from one to another then you don't have to uh, spend all that money to buy uh, an expensive lidar or some some other sensors that can be quite expensive that uh, um, that can cost easily more than the robot um, so that really brings down the price point if you can swap payloads uh, the other big things for us are uh, we use open source software um, so one of the problems, specifically in the in the in the robotics market, but kind of in the broader uh, industrial space, is vendor lock-in. Um, so when you have software written by the the same uh, same company that you bought your hardware from, um, it it creates uh, vendor lock-in where you where you're kind of stuck with that company for the hard for the software. Um, and you're kind of at their mercy of, of who they want to work with. And so if they have a large competitor that also makes hardware uh, and they, you know, they fight between the companies, then, then you're kind of stuck um, not being able to use both, both types of hardware in your, in your industrial facility. And so uh, we think that open source is the future of, of software for robotic systems and for, for industry in general, um, because it alleviates that vendor lock-in and you have none of your hardware vendors are writing the software it's it's community driven and 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 so there's uh there might be um you know paid support models kind of like how linux does it with with having red hat and and having different entities that that maintain linux but we've, we've seen from the ross uh community that that's that's the way that they're shifting and that's really going to alleviate any of and any vendor lock-in in the future So here's a here's a video of what one of our robots looks like uh, driving around. It's about the same size as uh, like a desktop computer with with wheels on it, uh, just to give you a sense of scale. So it's it's something that can be shipped very easily. That's another uh, big perk of us is uh, you don't have to deal with like freight shipping if you if you want to move these from facility to facility. They they ship very easily and 
you know, via FedEx or UPS or DHL. Um, so it really allows us to, to get our, our product to be stocked closer to the customer so we can have short lead times. We have a charging dock so you can, that allows for like fully, fully remote autonomous applications where you, you might have like an oil rig that's, uh, not easily accessed so you can have a robot just stationed there permanently and then it charges using that charging dock um, and then in, inside uh, we have so this is our r d payload this allows you to mount the sensors for your application very quickly and then inside you have all this space uh, for mounting your computer uh, that's a intel nook in there right now um, a lot of people start their proof of concepts with something like an Intel Nook, and then once they are scaling up to uh, usually over like 10 robots, then they start looking into more rugged options like the 80 link computers. And then on the top here, you can see the Intel RealSense and the uh, that's a 2D LiDAR that, that's also mounted to the top. Those are two of the most common sensors. And we have these three different drive types. This is the uh, what we call the flipper version. This one can climb upstairs. This is the four wheel drive version. Um, all of these those are interchangeable. So if you you would just buy your your chassis for your robot and you buy what you we call your drive kit, and your drive kits can be swapped out easily. So you can change in about it takes about five minutes to change a robot from a four wheel drive to a, a flipper robot. So people can. Uh, when they're initially uh, doing a proof of concept, they can they can buy multiple kits and see which uh, which drive type works better for their application. So this is one of our customers. Um, uh, they're called Scion Bot. They're located in Santa Monica. Um, they're doing uh, food delivery. Uh, so they they're operating a pretty sizable fleet now. They're a couple of grad students um, out of UCLA. And they're they're using our cheaper robot, the Rover Zero. Um, they they were our first customer that kind of proved out uh, our our business model of you know they're they're a couple of students. They purchased a robot on a credit card, uh, started making food deliveries with it, um, took some videos of it, and then goes went and raised money to um to start this company. And so um, that's what we're seeing with. Uh, with a lot of other customers now, but they were the first ones to actually uh, actually purchase a robot with a credit card and then and then successfully raise money and, and scale up their their fleet. Um, and so, if you remember from a couple slides ago, we we launched this product just back in March, uh, and so they were they they were one of the first buyers. They got their robot delivered within two weeks. Um, they were able to start making their uh, first food deliveries uh, a couple weeks later and take some videos of it. And then after a month, they they were funded. And uh, now they're looking to scale their robot fleet. They're right, right now, they're operating about 10 robots. Um, and right now, they're just in the phase of scaling that up to 50 robots. So that's going to be uh, competitive with some of the bigger names out there, like uh, like Starship and like um, like KiwiBot and and the other food delivery companies, and they were able to do that all within the span of of roughly six months, um, because because of the separation of the hardware vendor from the software and and uh, service company. Um, we see most robotics companies right now doing both the software and the hardware. And it, it makes uh, the proof of concepts take a lot longer. Um, it, usually it takes about a year just to get that first proof of concept and a video we're showing to investors. Um, and so this shortens that year time period um, down to just a, a couple of weeks if you have a, uh, some people who are skilled in robotics. So here's what uh, one of those delivery look, robots looks like uh, going down on the streets in Santa Monica. So this is an example of, of one of the customers who has a, a mixed approach to autonomy uh, where they, uh, they realize that um, full autonomous food delivery is, is going to be something that's uh, hard to achieve in a short period of time. 
there's just a lot of variability from city to city. Uh, so they auto automate what they can and they tally up the rest. Um, so at any given moment, it's, it's kind of switching between modes of autonomous and, and tally up. Uh, so we use um, both the the popular stacks uh, for robotics. Uh, one is the the Intel stack um, that that usually looks like a some computer that has an Intel CPU on it, like that Intel Nook or like one of the um, the 80 link computers, like the Viz AI is is becoming popular for us. Um, and then the Intel RealSense. Um, Specifically, like the Intel RealSense D435i has been one of the go-to sensors in the robotics community now uh, for doing uh, depth es estimation. So you can not only um, stop from hitting something like you can with a LiDAR, but you can also tell intelligently what that object is and then uh, react to it uh, differently than than you would if you were using LiDAR. For instance, if, if, uh, if there's water that's a huge problem um for for robots telling you know is this is this an inch deep puddle or or is it uh like a foot deep uh pothole that, that i'm gonna fall into and so you can you can start um doing some of that intelligence sticking that onto your robot and making smarter decisions and those are the types of decisions that are absolutely necessary for something like a food delivery robot and then the third part of the Intel stack is the Intel Movidius. Uh, that's their offering. It's that's it's an ASIC uh, application specific integrated circuit, um, and that's for doing uh, things like inference, um, very close uh, to the actual sensor itself. Um, so <clears throat> mainly in robotics, um, those are that's used for um, doing inference on images. Uh, so you can. So, so you can do things like, like tell, uh, tell what an object is, is, is the object a, a person or is it a, a parked car? And then you can uh, adapt and, and behave appropriately for what that object is. And then the other stack that we use on uh, is the NVIDIA side, uh, the NVIDIA Jetson line. Uh, those typically those use ARM processors, and then you're doing your inference on a, on a GPU instead of an ASIC. Um, so the, the main difference between the two stacks is um, if, you, if you're wanting full coverage uh, of your robot, so like 360 uh, degree field of view, um, usually that takes around six cameras uh, in order to get that. Uh, and the reason why you don't use like two cameras or like a, a, like a uh, a really wide angle lens is because you really shorten your detection distance if you have you spread out your pixels. Um, so if you want to keep that pixel density, you use like six cameras. And so with with the NVIDIA stack, uh, people usually hook all those cameras up to one computer and then process that 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 on a single GPU. And then for the, using the Intel stack, you can actually uh, have a dedicated chip uh, per sensor. Um, so this is uh, this is the Intel Movidius. Um, so you can uh, train your network. You can you can run it on their USB sticks, which have one of these ASICs inside of it, uh, to to test your application. And then once you have proven that out, you can actually put that uh, chip onto a board. And they're instead of uh, they just cost a few dollars instead of costing like a hundred dollars for a GPU. So that allows you to get it really close to the sensor. So here's an example of a Kickstarter project called the Oak Camera. Um, this is a group that put a Movidius chip on very close to the camera. So for each camera, you have a dedicated processor that's, that's doing inference. So you can actually load your model right onto the chip. And, and so uh, when you hook this camera up to a computer, uh, you can actually just send like the information that's important to your application, um, which are the detections, and you can uh, keep that load off your your main central computer. Uh, so you can do other things with that central processor, uh, like doing the uh, actual navigation, and you keep all the inference uh, at the camera. So then this is this is kind of what the 
the task that people are doing uh, with those devices. So this is a segmentation problem. And, and so this is the, the what's really needed for, for uh, specifically delivery applications to scale is you need to be able to segment everything out in an image and then kind of track where, uh, what everything is doing. So, so knowing, you know, there's a bicyclist moving in this direction and there's a person moving in that direction. Um, and there's a, a, maybe like a UPS mailbox that's not moving and I, I know it's a mailbox and I don't expect it to move. Um, uh, so then this is uh, what I was talking about in, uh, earlier in that we're, we're trying to create a prosumer market with our robots uh, so that you can, you can buy something on a credit card and, and prove it out very quickly. So on the left here is kind of right now, this is one of the uh, go-to robots for teaching uh, robotics in in schools and classrooms and you can see it's it's essentially just plastic plates with standoffs in between and some um, it has a raspberry pi that's powering it and a couple cheap motors and that one specifically goes for five hundred dollars and when you look at that compared to like like a dji drone that you can buy for five hundred dollars there it's a world of difference in terms of what you get for your money uh, and that's because of dji bringing two markets together and and being able to sell to both of them, uh, whereas where is that ha hasn't happened in the robotics market. Uh, so you you see these robots that are five hundred dollars and and there's not much engineering thought that that went into them. Um, and then the on the professional side, in the middle, you see the Amir robot. That's one of the most popular warehouse robots. Um, there they go for thirty thousand to eighty thousand dollars. Uh, they're very good at what they do. Uh, so Mir has been very good at proving out, proving out that you can get a good ROI, uh, even paying thirty to eighty thousand dollars, and they've been very successful. Um, but we think that there's there's a lot of applications outside of warehouse uh, that that need a lower price point. And right now, the ROI uh, calculations just don't make sense uh, because of the high hardware cost. And so we're looking to to bring that down. Um, and yeah, so we're, so we're trying to create a prosumer market, uh, where you can buy robots for 500 to $5,000 and have those be well-designed, uh, high quality, uh, able to purchase them very quickly. So the, the future for us looks like, uh, so, so far we've created, uh, a robot that's uh, in the $5,000 price point. Uh, we've created one that's in the $2,000 price point. Uh, so the future for us is creating sub thousand dollar price uh, price point robots um, that you can still do business applications. You can they're still rugged enough so that you can mount a sensor to it and and drive it around a facility, um, but it but it's now under a thousand dollars. So so think of all the things that you can now do uh, if if you can buy something for say like seven ninety nine uh, and quickly and easily get up and running, get it to be autonomous. Um, yeah, we think there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of applications that that people will think up. So yeah, that, that's it for my presentation. Um, I got my our contact information here. If you if you have uh, we can do questions now and then if you have any offline things you can email info at roverobotics.com. Hey Nick, thanks for that. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, does anybody have any questions? I, I do have one here from Matthew Roberts. Nick, have you ever had any vandal anyone vandalize your or your customers' robots because they were worried about them becoming Terminator? <laughs> uh, I don't know if they were worried about them becoming Terminator, but they that that company that that I was talking about, Cyan Robotics, they have uh, they have seen. Uh, some vandalism. And I, I show them because a lot of our other customers are industrial and they, they're they pretty secretive about what they're doing for robotics projects. So that, that happens to be one customer that's very vocal about uh, what they're doing. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's some vandalism involved. I think uh, to a large extent, like robots rolling around are, they, they'll all have GPS and I'll have, uh, computers capable of detecting a person. So 
the response time if there's any vandalism or or someone steals the robot and, and walks away with it uh it's very quick since you uh since you have someone who's sitting at a computer monitoring your fleet of robots and and they they actually see the the video feed up on the screen of like 10 robots all in front of them and so if if someone like throws a a, a a blanket over a robot and walks away with it, which has happened. Uh, they respond in uh, under a couple hours uh, to go to go get that robot, and they have the the GPS location of it. Uh, they have, you know, what the person looks like from from the cameras from uh, from when they approach the robot. So I see that probably as delivery robots become more abundant, I see kind of uh, we'll we'll see a, a huge spike in. And kind of those vandalism events, um, and then I expect a, a steep drop off after people realize, um, oh, it's quite easy uh, for the police to track down who who vandalized the robot, um, and and it's not quite worth it. Yeah. So, so, so is is the connectivity that's being used here um, uh, cellular connectivity? I presume. Yep. Uh, yeah. So right now they're running on on four G networks. And and are they utilizing edge computing quite heavily to to minimize the amount of data that's being um, sent? Yeah, definitely. And any any term anything in terms of like inference, uh, they they do on the edge, and and anything they do in terms of video compression and and all that, and it is done on the edge um, because the the bandwidth limitations uh, and. Are just too great and they don't want to they a don't want to pay for extra data that they don't have to and they and b they want as fast as a response time as possible so they put the compute as close to the edge as they can sensible uh david david scott i believe you've got a couple of questions yeah yeah thanks uh, thanks for the talk nick um i've got a couple of questions about some of the applications you mentioned at the beginning um about hazardous environments such as chemical plants and nuclear for example yeah and, and I guess my question there is, um, one is um, you know, battery life. I mean, how, how, how long can the, the, um, your units go without charging or what range can they do? And, and secondly, just looking specifically at those sort of nuclear, sort of very hazardous environments, um, to what extent is, is this new type of technology making inroads into that market and displacing, if you like, the, the sort of the classical suppliers? And also you, you mentioned uh, teleops versus autonomous um, operation and I guess in that nuclear sort of environment it, are, are there very strict regulations which mean that you have to have sort of essentially a teleop sort of override at all times yeah great questions uh, so I think so most of our customers in that space we we sell through system integrators who are used to uh, integrating others other forms of uh, industrial equipment into those sectors uh, so right now it's kind of like an experimental phase where where the end customers are kind of curious about you know how how would how would a robot uh, increase coverage in our facility so so they reach out to a system integrator and the system integrator says well I've had a, a couple other customers try uh, try robots and and here's the results here's what they're better at and and here's what here's their limitations and so we're working like. We're, we're part of a, a field along with like companies like Boston Dynamics who are trying to change the perception of, of what you can do with robots uh, in those types of facilities. So it's pretty new in terms of regulations uh, that actually govern mobile robots versus other type of equipments. Uh, so pretty much right now, the regulations that do exist are, are written because of other devices. So there's, for instance, intrinsic safety, uh, so you don't cause an explosion. Um, that that has been transferred over to, to mobile robots um, as well. Uh, so, you, so you need like all solid state components and stuff uh, if you're operating in, in any environment that there could be gas leaks so you don't uh, explode anything. Um, the other safety requirements are like all the normal um, uh, device component regulations like UL and CE and and FCC and all, all those ones, um, but in terms of actual robot specific ones, uh, it's it's very it's very new, and so they're they're just now building up what those regulations might be. 
uh, they're a bit behind the warehouse market, which is really the warehouse market's the only one that's that's come out with um, specific regulations just targeting mobile robots. That's that's the only one that's kind of reached the scale uh, to to warrant that and and been operating for a long enough time period where regulators have have come out with those regulations. Okay, thank you. Just about the batteries, is that is that a constraint or is, is the battery lifetime sufficient for your needs at the moment? Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to answer that. Um, so our batteries last around four or five hours of constant drive use. That'll be more like 12 to 24 hours of standby, depending on what computer and sensors you have on top of it. So um, we, we have two options for when your battery is running low. You can either do a hot swap. So if there is if there is a person available to swap out the battery, then that's a way of getting instantly back to full charge or the charging dock, which which takes about two or three hours to, to charge a robot back to full charge. Um, so we find a lot of our customers uh, that that's sufficient uh, battery life and especially customers who are trying to use uh, either drones or legged robots before. Drones typically have a battery life of 30 minutes, legged robots are about 90 minutes, and then wheeled robots are about four or five hours. Uh, so we have um, we have a leg up on the competition, uh, no pun intended, um, in, in that realm specifically. Okay, that's great, thank you very much, thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, so Nick, um, with you know, with the global COVID that we have going on at the moment, um, have you seen any sort of use cases with anybody that you've been talking with on sort of helping with the impact of that and sort of thinking quite in, in, innovatively um, utilizing uh, robots? Yeah, the, the the two main ones would be uh, disinfecting and telepresence. So initially, we we got a lot of interest for disinfecting. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of them were targeting hospitals. And in the US, at least, there's regulations. If you stick um, a UV light on something to disinfect, uh, you have to have the door closed when it's actually operating. Uh, and that's to protect uh, people's skin uh, who might be in the same, uh, who might be walking by. So essentially, if you have a robot that's disinfecting a space, if there's a door that the robot can't open, then essentially, you're no better than a cart. Uh, so a person could open the door, push the cart in, and and that's something that they have in hospitals. So, uh, so we've we've seen a lot of those customers struggle with with hospital applications, but we actually found commercial spaces is is a big uh, market where you don't have those doors. So if you have like a a, a grocery store or or like a, a Walmart or a Target where uh, you can send the robot around this big space and disinfect the whole thing every night um, with UV light. Uh, we've seen that be uh, a, a successful application. Um, and then the other one would be telepresence. So a lot of people all of a sudden were no longer able to travel. And so people were looking for alternative ways of, of managing um, sites. So um, they would use, uh, some companies started adopting uh, robotics so that they could they could have a robot sitting at a charge on a charging dock at any time uh, and then they could drive around the robot uh, to to take a look at things and so um, we weren't specifically in the telepresence space before COVID-19 um, so uh, there's a lot of other companies that are that are doing that specifically um, but we did get customers reaching out to us um, where most of those telepresence robots are can only operate on flat uh, flat ground. So we got a lot of companies reaching out to us uh, who had uh, more rugged terrain. So like con uh, construction companies who, who wanted to mo monitor their sites and they wanted a tracked robot that could go upstairs and go over things on the ground. Um, those those sorts of entities started using our robots for for telepresence. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we chatted um, a few weeks ago about the uh, the use case on the um, the building yard for the uh, stock replenish. Uh, yeah. I thought it was really innovative. Um, so would you, would you like to give a little bit of an overview on that? Yeah, so uh, one, of, one of the big things that we see people doing is trying to catch any discrepancy in their business, specifically around inventory. 
Um, so if you're if you're monitoring any sort of inventory, whether you're your target and you're you're trying to figure out what's stocked on your shelves, or you're uh, you're a steel yard and you're you're wondering how much steel you have at, at certain locations, or or maybe you're uh, the army and you're you're trying to keep track of how many vehicles you have on site, or maybe you're a rental car company, and you're trying to keep track of those cars. All of those applications, uh, you can do that inventory kind of unstructured. Uh, inventory management uh, with a robot and you can send a robot around with the camera um, and it can if you have barcodes it can read barcodes if it if, if you have other markings it can read those um, and so you send the robot around and and the most successful implementations of this uh, is if you ever see a discrepancy uh, you you hook that up to your ERP system and it sends an email to the, the correct person saying we were expecting uh, we're expecting to see, you know, uh, two tons of steel in this uh, in this bay, um, but but we're we're measuring the volume to be much much less. You know, we're measuring uh, maybe one tenth that. So so probably that indicates that like uh, a a manufacturing order that was supposed to be done that day uh, was not done, or maybe a shipment went out that, that wasn't recorded in your ERP system. So you can, you can catch those times when things aren't recorded, um, or when things are either lost, shipped to the wrong place or stolen. So, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, if you think about the, the smart pilot solution, it's really making that mobile, um, and expanding its use cases, um, based on yep. the, the basic same principle. Um, but really, you know, turn, turn on that um, vision as a sense from IOT um, on the wheels, pardon the pun with the surname I've got. But um, yeah, uh, yeah making, making things mobile. Excellent. Uh, we have one question from Amit. Um, with increasing the number of robots, do you see that some regulations might be needed to own and operate robots? I guess similar is happening with drones. Yeah, definitely. Like the big thing right now is. Uh, at, at least in the U.S., is that they're pushing out regulations so that you you'll be they hope that you'll be able to point a device or like a smartphone at a drone and, and be able to tell who's operating it so you so they can limit those events where maybe like here there's someone who is encroaching on airspace and and you can figure out who is actually operating that robot. I think there's going to be similar uh, types of regulations, but they're going to be probably an order of magnitude less because in the ground space, just because um, the the safety concerns are less, at least at the the size of robots that we operate at. Um, one of our robots fully loaded with with like a payload, um, doing some sort of delivery application, probably maxes out at, at around, um, I'd say maybe like 50 kilograms. Um, so, so the safety regulations around that are are going to be much less than say like uh, some of the bigger delivery vehicles like the company Neuro, they're having one that's that's quite sizable or autonomous vehicles or drones. Um, it, it's just much less safety considerations when you when you don't have as much ability to, to harm people. And then we're already seeing some regulations in, in cities, mainly San, San Francisco put a, overnight they put a ban on delivery robots and then they issued only a couple permits to select companies. I see that happening in other cities that as as these things roll out. Um, so you have to have um, certification from the city itself, a, a permit to actually operate uh, legally so that they can make sure that you have certain uh, things on the device, um, uh, like like maybe an e-stop button or, or some way of, uh, of like moving, uh, disabling or like moving the robot uh, in, in a secure, secure way, so. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Um, there are a couple of uh, questions there in regards to uh, the politics um, and some queries about some uh, customer support. I don't know if you would mind in chat um, responding to those um, uh, as we move on to uh, Wireless Logic's uh, talk. Hey, Nick, thanks very much. That was a brilliant talk. Really appreciate it. And got some great, great feedback. John, great to see you online. Thanks for joining. Um, okay, so thanks again, Nick. So we have... Thank you.